We bring the top beers podcasts. Welcome to Beer Bubble. Hi all, we're back with part two of the Swedish beer history episode. We travel through the 17th century up until today with beer historian Joel Hedman. Enjoy. Hey everyone and welcome back to Beer Bubbles, the number one bubbliest podcast in the world we think. And you have listened to the first episode now, right? Well, hopefully you have. Yeah, if you haven't, do that because I'm not going to explain <laughs> the situation right here. Uh, we're going to continue on where we left off, and that's the 1600s before we're going to go up towards the future. And this is Joel Hedman, by the way. This yes. is Joel, yeah. Yeah. Mm? yeah. Um, well, <laughs> okay, let's see where I was. Uh, what I really wanted to make sure I mentioned a little bit more from, from uh, all those visitors that came to Sweden back in the 1600s because they... They give us a unique insight into the s- drinking traditions in Sweden because oftentimes the Italians and the French and whatnot found them rather strange. <laughs> a- and the funny part, which I love the most, is that you can recognize some of them. Like they're still around in some way, but they were a little bit more extreme historically. Uh, one of my favorite ones is in the late 1600s. Uh, let's see, it's Charles the um, 11th. I think it was, and he met up with uh, somebody involved with uh, Uppsala University, and they met in Uppsala Slot, Uppsala Castle, uh, and they were drinking beer together. And when you drink beer, you you toast, and then you drink, then you finish your beer. So you never leave anything in your glasses like we do here. <laughs> mm. uh, you have to finish them all. And if you were rich, you'd afford all the drinking vessels in the world you have like a fancy beer bar for example you have one glass for every beer and after a while it gets a little difficult if you're in a bigger setting and people are cheering with you then you drink maybe they could double check that you finished all that you should but whenever you toasted with somebody you had to drink otherwise that was an insult you could take out your sword and stab me down if i didn't but when this guy was drinking with the king. He felt a little overwhelmed. He couldn't continue. So he started to cheat and hide a bunch of glasses behind the um, curtain, like putting them away to like try to survive the night. Uh, and that might feel like a nice compromise, okay? He doesn't know. I'm not insulting the king, but still I don't have to get overly drunk. But the fact is the king finds out that this guy has been leaving beer behind. Now, what do you think the king did in the late 1600s? Executed him? <laughs> no. <laughs> it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't that bad. But okay. he ordered him to drink every last drop. <laughs> so he's oh, like, he took every glass, and then he's like, okay, you finish this one? And when you're done with that, finish this one, take that. And he continued like that until he drank all the beers, because otherwise it would have been an insult. So that's <laughs> Just like you, you, you force your kids to eat their vegetables when they don't finish that. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little bit like but that. But is, yeah. it, it, so is there any truth to, like, when you toast, you toast with your right hand? Because you can uh, reach for your, for your sword or... Yeah, it's, it's, uh, there are a bunch of different... I'm not sure which things are just theories and what is, but it's, it's always like you're, you're open, you're showing, you're showing your hands, and you're looking at somebody... It's it's all a way of sort of showing trust. But I'm not sure. You're supposed to eat with one hand and then sort of wipe your ass with the other one <laughs> if you go back <laughs> historically. Um, but it's it's all like um, showing that you're not, you're not here as an enemy. I, mm. If I, for example, would have um, fought any of you guys when we're sitting like this drinking together mm. and we're cheering, now we're showing that we're friends. So if I would have, let's say, I punched any of you guys, it would have been... Twice as bad because I'd, I just I shown was, us that you've been yeah you're a friend mm. yeah so mm. that would be like um, yeah me disrespect disrespect <laughs> in a, in a bigger way mm. right. so um, yeah definitely many funny traditions when it comes when it comes to beer that were really 
firm and important. Also, you could always have it has a had a legal obligation in beer. You toast it over a beer, like that was a way of making um, document valid. Like you were, it's it's a like way a of sort of opening right, up right. and becoming mm -hmm. friends, uh, sort of. So back in the day, going home to the family pissed drunk was actually about life and death. Actually, that's another fun thing. <laughs> uh, there's a, a Swedish historian, I should remember her name, Annika something. She writes, she focuses on the 1600s, specifically, or Sturmax, uh, the, the great era of Sweden. Uh, and she wrote about a trick that they used, uh, fathers used to see if the, the son-in-law, if he, he was a suitable suitor for their daughters. Like, they would get them really, really drunk and see how they behaved. They would also see how they would behave if they lost it they they cheated at uh, different sort of gambling so see if they were b sore losers and if they were bad drunks and if they were sore losers and bad drunks they wouldn't uh, allow their daughters to marry them should, should bring that nowadays back. as well yeah, bring, <laughs> yeah, bring that back, back yeah. god damn it <laughs> <laughs> can't hold your liquor get the fuck out of here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something totally unrelated I heard the other day, which because I find drinks and history fun as well. Yeah. <laughs> I heard that the only part of the English military that doesn't have to stand up when they toast the Queen is the Royal Navy. Because uh, there was an admiral uh, who sat in the galley with a couple of sailors and they drank and they stood up when they toasted the Queen and he hit his head on a beam. <laughs> and then he went to the Queen and complained. So after that, the Royal Navy didn't have to stand up when they toasted the Queen. Oh, okay. Even when there's not a beam above their heads. They don't have to stand oh. up when they toast uh, the Queen. Okay. That's a luxury. <laughs> 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 All right. What happens if you don't stand up, if you're not a na in the Navy? Well, you you would. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I think you don't stay around that no, much no, longer. No, no, no. Punk rockers <laughs> agree with you, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> you would probably not be in any part of the uh, military in, in no, the UK if you, probably not. <laughs> if you didn't. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> so that was totally unrelated, but still, drinks and history. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it is. Should we continue with the beer number f four, right? F f four. four. Yes. Uh, <laughs> We're going to go for that one, yeah. We'll leave that Are one for last. Okay. That one okay. before that. One. Yeah. I think so. Either way. This, this, this got older tradition. Oh, yeah. At that's, least. True, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, in Sweden, or, uh, it well, this style has got older tradition. Yeah. In Bel in Belgium, but not in Sweden, right? No. Or uh, it all came in the late 1900s? Or? Um, when it came. 1836. 1836. Yeah. Was the beginning of that period. But this. Mm. Actually, the, these guys started in 1935, uh, mm. but the style is older, oh, yeah. I'd say, because mm. this is... Uh, well, you tell us what this is. Yes, we are drinking the... I don't think I can think of any other brewery that brews just one beer. They brew one that is weaker in alcohol content, I've heard, mm. uh, but they just have one brand, and that's Orval. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the first properly uh, strong imported beer that came to Sweden. Yep. And uh, it's a good example of uh, Brettanomyces as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what that is like. But it's it's not a sour beer. Uh, this is a Trappist beer. And Trappists are not monks because they're Sisistaner monks. But the breweries, uh, the, the cloisters that have breweries are called Trappist cloisters. Certified by the Pope. So cheers. 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 Yeah, that was really good. Mm. Mm. It usually is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's one of the seven original Trappist breweries. Yeah. Uh, there was six in Belgium and one in Holland from the beginning. And now there's 13, I think, around the world. Mm. Uh, but this, the, the reason we have this style is because this style also came to Sweden through monks. Oh, you mean uh, B Belgian style um, yeah. sort of beers? Mm. Yeah. The monasteries... They would have uh, quite a lot of beer themselves. Uh, another funny story about the monks and beer is that they also they grow their own hops, uh, not just for beer brewing, but also because it's supposed to have a reducing effect on your sexual urges. Ah. Uh, so it, hops is also a sedative. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural way of reducing your... Libido. <laughs> yes. Um but when it comes to Belgian styles of beer, the documentation where you can more or less figure out exactly which beer we still have, which is of Belgian descent, 
um, in Sweden would be through the um, how you say Valona Valonic the Valonic yeah mm. the Val- the Valonic mm-hmm. uh, uh, craftsmen that came over they uh, brought with them their old own beer culture because they were not they were not big fans of the the, the Swedish beer that we were brewing at all they came mm. in the early 1600s and they were brewing th- the beer that stayed around after they were not working there anymore was the uh, what we call the hundred year old beer which would be like an uh, uh, odd uh, odd brune or a mm. I don't know how to say that in a good way uh, brune odd brune, brune. brune. Um, but where they would have like a big um, barrel or vat mm. of beer and they would have the the tap on the vat in the middle of it rather at the very bottom so that when you poured beer you could only empty it half uh, the barrel halfway through and that way you could always keep the beer and the yeast alive because when you've once you've gotten down to the tap or whatever you want to call it um, you'd have to fill it up with new beer and that way the yeast stayed alive so in essence you're drinking beer that could be as old as a hundred years yeah mm-hmm. uh, and we have many examples of beer that were alive for for centuries in that was way. one of those you fill up new with the old so you let the old uh, product infuse with the with the new and and uh, also when it comes to beer the yeast in the old product keeps on growing all the time so it keeps on fermenting no. it doesn't end no Uh, I'm not sure to what extent they managed to keep them um, that much active when it went into the hands of of, of the Swedes um, <laughs> over over the years, but I think it's still a fun thing that that has been around all the way since then, and I know there are a bunch of people that are still doing the same, having the same tradition. One guy in Uppsala uh, lectured about this at. Uh, Smurf, a um, beer festival that has retired a few years ago. I saw him talk about this subject. Um, so that's a pretty fun one when it comes to Belgian-style beer. But we have, of course, been... It's been around us, but we don't know too much what exactly was being drank. And the Valonic, uh, like craftsmen, they they were from Flanders, uh, and they came here to uh, work steel, basically. They were yeah. st- steel uh, steel experts, Back yeah. in the day. <laughs> and they were smart in a way that the Germans weren't, uh, because they kept... <laughs> <laughs> well, they, 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 I'm not saying that the you Germans were going to get cancelled. <laughs> you no. were going to get cancelled. <laughs> But what, what they did was, they, they definitely, they stayed, they stuck to their own, their own in a mm. way. So a lot of the German craftsmen, uh, the German crafts were easier to take on uh, by... By the population, or the local craftsmen. Yeah, local craftsmen. Yeah. They they would learn from from the other. But when it comes to the the Volonic, they would uh, usually stick with their own people and sort of keep it more like a family secret. Mm. Plus, it was a lot more advanced in a lot of cases. Uh, there, for example, working with steel and mm. things like that, it would would have been a little bit more tricky. Yeah. Well, we talked before the interview about Svenskjöl. What is that? Oh, that, that's a difficult one uh, because we know the the m- most that we know about it is that it was divided into different uh, alcohol content, and uh, the richer you were, the fancier and stronger beer you drank. But that was the the beer. It le- kind of like today, if you look aside, if you put craft beer aside, what you drink is just beer, and Svenskjöl would be just the beer that you brewed. Uh, but you would divide it like if it was a party or if you were like a friend of the king, you would drink, for example, Herrl, which would be like, a, well, the gentry style. Yeah, uh, like the mm. rich guy's beer. Whereas if you were a poor, you would drink something weaker and you that would be, for example, called Sven the Earl. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> It's pretty funny because Sven is like you like a sort of a derogatory term for a Swede. But it's a Swedish uh, white trash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Swedish white trash. <laughs> but also a Sven there was a sort of a, a Sven would be a low like you would you would be farmhands, for example. Mm-hmm. That would be a farmhouse a farmhouse Sven <laughs> mm-hmm. a, a, a guy who would help out and do the the easier work. Uh so that would be the beer that you drink. Another sort of um 
lower ABV beer would be, for example, ship beer. And I'm, I'm, it's important that you hear the P at the end, ship beer. Not no, ship beer. No, no tea. <laughs> no tea. <laughs> ship beer. Because that would be the beer that you would have if you went on long sea journeys. For example, you'd stack the, the, the bottom of the, the, the ballast is just full of beer. So you'd, drink, so you'd have beer that you could drink because water went bad so mm. and then when you went to russia you went past gotland and i'm a f- descent from gotland so mm. i i love this part they went to gotland because on gotland they did something called dragel which they actually brought with them you would drink in the ship beer until you got to the different rivers in russia and had to pull the boats between the different rivers because then you were given dragel which was extremely strong <laughs> so you wouldn't feel how bad it hurt to pull these ships between the different rivers in Russia. <laughs> and then uh, it works as a w- word joke. The blev drag. Anyway. I don't think we can translate that into that joke. Yeah. Doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> Cheers, guys. It's Cheers. Like, it's like Gothenburg yolks in Saint Sweden. We're talking too much. We drink it. We're not drinking enough. Or oh, you aren't. I'm finishing my glasses, but. Uh, no, yeah. I'm a bit more timid. <laughs> I would the more historical <laughs> ones, uh, they are they are nice. They're very well balanced, but maybe not to to my personal liking. Well, I, I, I've filled <laughs> up the glass with the Schlenkela Rauch beer here <laughs> myself. <Yeah. laughs> uh, speaking of which, uh, if it's okay with you, I wanted to do um, just because you can't. No, uh, I wanted to do like a little mix because we want to try. If you want to get closer to what a um, like a Svensk girl would have tasted like. Mm-hmm. I think we want to bring in, like, I have a base, which is Orval, that mm. makes it a little fruity and uh, take a glass definitely makes it an ale. Mm. Uh, and then you pour a little bit of uh, Schlenkela to get a little smokiness. Mm. Um, and half and half, or basically? Or? Uh, I think uh, you go bit. half and half, more or less. I'm going to try out. and do. I, I'm timid in the beginning, and then we'll see where we end up. So we're adding a new title uh, for you now, Mixologist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then we could add in. It would have been nice to have something a sour beer now to get a little bit of that in, but instead we could just pour in a little bit of the um, the the darker of the um, Gale beers. The you are just a bit, yeah. bit. Yep, just to get something odd and funky in there, <laughs> herbal, and then we. You want me to get some malt vinegar as well? Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. that'd be fun. You c- keep on talking. I'll go get yeah. some malt vinegar. Perfect. <laughs> See where we end up. This seems quite weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there is though. Yet to this day, you 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 do actually mix beers. Some some brewers do. Yeah, so, so it's uh, some truth in that. But th- this is to find out basically or imagine what the beer tasted like before. Yeah, because I think um, the the smokiness would have been there, and it would have definitely been a rather warm fermented ale. So it, you would have a lot of esters in there, uh, most likely. <laughs> it looks like hot sauce. Uh, it's a little strange. Malt vinegar. There we go. I'll do a few drips. A few more drips. A few more drips. There we go. So now I have essentially a little bit of everything in here. But what's important to get a little bit of uh, funk or sourness from the vinegar uh, smoke and then make it more ailey. <laughs> there the, you go. This is going to be interesting. Cheers, guys. Cheers. God, it smells. <laughs> That's not too bad. No, it works. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is nothing like mixing light lager with soy sauce, I tell you. This, <laughs> this is actually quite good. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. You usually mix light lager with soy sauce? No, there was a bit of like a Swedish TV show about the Swedish beer tr- trip or something. Ah, okay. Where they met up with a guy who... Uh, Oh, we like dark beers, but I they didn't have a dark beer. So when he said, like, when I don't have a dark beer, I'll take a light beer and I'll pour some soy sauce in it. Uh. And um, you can see that he normally used, like, colored soy. It's ah, not proper okay. soy, so he just color. Yeah. Uh, and they gave him proper soy sauce, and he drank it, and you can see on his face that this was not what he signed on for. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> so he just wanted the color, not the taste. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that one. that was interesting, really, yeah, because yeah. the the tartan. Uh, that's why I brought malt vinegar as well, because it's probably would have been that, mm. uh, yeah. uh, just to get a bit of sourness too. Yeah, definitely. I think um, if we would have had 
some really old hops because I don't think they would have had very fresh hops. No. So uh, if you take um, some, some aged hops and get that in there as well, you get a better feel of, of what the, the beer was like because it's not like you had them in those vacuumed bags and you put them in the freezer like we do with hops You today. know what it tastes like a bit? Gotlands Oh, yeah. yeah. I, you're right. I had my first Gotlands Dricku only um, six months ago. Yeah. And I, I loved it, actually. It's like smoky, a bit tart, but still malty and, and, yeah. and full. I've and that's historic, it. right? Yeah. And that's, that's really historic. That's, and that's also, like, it's still a proper farmhouse variant. So it's, the recipe is different from farm to farm. Yeah. And everyone says they, that their dad or their uncle does the best one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, that actually worked. I've got to ask you a bit about traditional beer styles because I've got you here now. Yeah. There's so many different traditional beer styles that's fallen out of memory. And then some of them have come back. Yeah. Like Gosa, for example, yeah. was totally dead for about 100 years. Yeah. Came back about 10 years ago. And it sells like crazy. Berliner Weisse as well. Yeah. One of the, a few of the ones that hasn't come back but might do is Gretzer. Yeah. Which is a smoked wheat beer. Yeah. Or actually a beer with smoked wheat, not a smoked mm. wheat beer. There's a difference. <laughs> uh, Lichtenheiner, which is basically yeah. the same style. And Grisette, yeah. which is a wheat. Wheat yeah, There's a few. Yeah, well, like I mean, the one I know of. Yeah. Well, you've got a tattoo on your hand with <laughs> the brand for one Grisette <laughs> from Ore. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but those styles, why is it coming back? I think we just got to find the the next the next thing, uh, but I also think that if you have something that's quenchable, like literally, if it's balance, just might be balance between stranger things <laughs> uh, <laughs> or things that you're not as used to. But it's, it's still a good beer. We're just trying to broaden what beer is. I think that's what craft beer movement is still to this day. What is contained in the word beer? Mm. Because I mean. And that is obviously contained in the word beer, as we used to brew that beer historically. But we just want to get more of the old weird stuff back. So Are we, we running out of ideas, uh, new ideas? Or well, maybe when we want to take care of our history and, and see what we had before. and Or we, we, the evolution of the beer scene in the world has gone very fast in a couple of years. It exploded, really. Could have been that it's gone so far that people are starting to look back and like, okay, historically, what did we make? Yeah. Is well, this old recipe I found in my fa- grandfather's book? <laughs> it also feels like the era of uh, running out of ideas. If you look, <laughs> if you go to the movies, have you been to the movies lately? <laughs> oh, <Jesus. laughs> like, this is a remake of the remake. Of, yeah, uh, and the sequel of the sequel, <laughs> yeah. and here comes the prequel to the sequel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe, but... Um, I think there are going to be a lot more new beer styles that are coming around that we wouldn't be able to really imagine today. Should we talk a bit about modern history in Sweden? Yeah. Because um, we have one of the most classic Swedish beers ever yes, made. We uh, do. Uh, in front of us. Uh, and when we say modern, we might want to adjust it a little bit. But yes, uh, be- the porter... Oh, it's a little shooken up. You hurry, hurry, hurry. There you go. Okay. <laughs> The porter is a beer from the 1700s, and it came to Sweden rather quickly. Um, so we've had it, we've had the uh, porter style almost as long as they have in England. Because um, the style comes from England. Yeah, and that's why porters are still really big in Gothenburg, because that was the big port on the west coast. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't I know didn't they know. were big there. No, <laughs> I didn't know they were big there. Porter is massive in Gothenburg. And this brewery... Uh, no, I, I thought you said something else. Sorry, I was well, spacing out. I thought you were talking about Visby again. No, no, no. Yeah, Gothenburg. No, Gothenburg, I Gothenburg. know. I know yeah. that. I remember yeah. correctly. Sorry. Was it, was it a Scottish family who started that brewery? In the beginning? Uh, yes. Yes. And the the, re- the reason they chose that was because the harsh waters... The porter was the only style that can be made by the water before the technology was to... What I know is that because um, I actually went to a guy, uh, I went with the um, uh, local guide in Gothenburg. I was there in May for um, a judge beer there. Sorry, I really spaced out. I thought you were still talking about <laughs> talking about Vispi again. I was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, but in 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 Gothenburg, they were really close to England, had a lot of ties, and 
He claims, even though in a lot of books they say that the porter came to Stockholm, it was brewed in Stockholm first, but he says it's definitely in Gothenburg first. And that makes more sense. But either way, Mm. uh, the porter quickly became a little hip because it was a new style. And it's the first style to be brewed in a bottle as well. Because okay. all other beer was uh, in a, like in a barrel. So you didn't drink beer from a bottle before the porter. Hmm. So the porter is the first glass bottle beer that you'd have. Um, I'm not sure if it was because it was fermented in the bottle and you just or it just was the new trend. Mm-hmm. But um, I'm going to get into when we get into uh, if we talk about lager beer and more modern. Mm-hmm. I can talk about when the glass bottle became common. But. That's the first glass bottle. And anyways... And it's the D. Carnegie uh, Brewery. Uh, yes. Started in 1836 in Gothenburg. Definitely. By David Carnegie and his son. Part of the same Carnegie family that actually went to the U.S. to Pittsburgh and started all the steelworks and stuff. And Made Carnegie Hall Ho- and yeah. is from that heritage. Yeah. So it's... it's um, a lot of history in that family. There's a lot of history in that family, and they, and it is the most famous porter brand, and the only one who survived. Yeah. Mm. Actually, since I, well, both me and Rasmus used to work at Carnegie Brewery, the new Carnegie Brewery, the new Carnegie Brewery in <laughs> Stockholm, uh, I know quite a bit of history about the brewery, and uh, during the prohibition in Sweden, the only brewery that actually grew was Carnegie. Yeah. <laughs> They got some sort of an exemption from the uh, from from other beer uh, when it came to uh, restrictions and things like that. Yeah, beginning. because people could go to the doctors and, and yeah. uh, get prescribed yeah, water for, for uh, nervous illness. Yeah, and, and yeah. trouble sleeping and, yeah. and also with uh, if you had trouble eating and things like mm. that. Oftentimes during Christmas or Easter, people had troubles with very... Similar things. Mm-hmm. Back then, it was its original strength, which was somewhere around 7%. Mm-hmm. So they, they lowered it. But, but I mean, the, the porter really came here and became very popular right away. And it's funny when you look at it from the perspective of England, where it feels like it's more of a um, working man's drink. Here, it was like, oh, really posh, fancy beer that mm-hmm. everybody was drinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were if you were rich enough to drink it, and we know, for example, that Bellman, of course, drank it, our uh, Swedish singer, poet, uh, drinker, <laughs> <laughs> drank a lot of porter. But it also has some other interesting connections, like for example, during the time when we used to hang people over in Hammarbyhöjden, <laughs> when that was the place for uh, like gallows, the gallows Hill, <laughs> yeah, the gallows. <laughs> then you would have one stop on the way, along the way by. Um, it's right near Gröna Jägaren today, which is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is on nice Yeah, and, yeah. And they would stop in for their last drink, and they had three choices for the last drink. One was uh, like aquavit or um, heavy mm-hmm. liquor, which would probably have been my choice, uh, champagne, or porter. Those were the three choices as mm-hmm. your last drink. I don't have any statistics on how many people chose a porter as their last drink, but <laughs> um, but it was a big drink. Back yeah, then. it was definitely mm. a big drink. We had several breweries that brewed porter just in Stockholm alone, and Gothenburg, as we talked about, very much a porter town still to this day. Also, it's connected to pastries in a way. Mm. Uh-huh. Because a brief period in the 1800s, uh, something called Sveitserier, uh, which is essentially a bakery with rights uh, to serve alcohol. <laughs> uh, for a brief period, we could have those. And for those of you who live in Stockholm or are Swedish, you could go to Skansen and you could go to Gubhylan, which is an old preserved building from that used to be one of those bakeries. And in there, they would serve uh, quite a lot of porter. So you'd have a pastry and a porter, maybe a cigar, and then maybe something stronger. And you'd sit there with your buddies. Like if you were a rich guy in the 1800s, you didn't spend much time at home. You would be out with your buddies all day, just eating and drinking, it feels Spending like. Spending money. Yeah, it was important <laughs> if you had money to spend money or show that you had money. So so those... Um, That's when my kind of body type was the ideal, wasn't it? <laughs> you were supposed yeah. to be fat because people <laughs> knew, knew that you were Fatted well off richer. enough to eat well and drink well. Yeah, you you would look uh, a little healthy, you know. So we usually <laughs> say fat and happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But also, it's still on the, to this day has a living tradition when it comes to a meal that 
It's yeah. very common in the Swedish kitchen. The, so, yeah, the yeah. porter steak. Yeah, porter steak or uh, bryggadesar or brewer's yeah. dessert is also with chocolate cake with porter. And oh yeah, mm-hmm. I didn't know they call it bryggadesar. Yeah, though, but uh, it feels like an old school thing. Like my grandmother uh, had that connection mm-hmm. with it. So I guess they brought those from say this the the old bakery Swisseries. the Swisseries. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you call those. <laughs> Uh, we touched on to the prohibition, dark yeah. age in Sweden. Yes, definitely a dark age. Uh, in the 1800s, they start doing a bunch of different restrictions. It gets more and more difficult. Well, first we have a first we have a peak, and the peak mainly comes from the lager breweries. I'm not sure if I could go in here now because that's also a long one. But lager beer comes to Sweden, and it comes to Southern Malm in Stockholm first, because there is a guy who opens the German brewery. He brings with him a German guy from Bombay, a brewer, uh, and they open the German brewery pretty close to a Nytoyet today. And they open this brewery right in the middle of nowhere because this was considered really far away. Today it's <laughs> in the inner city of Stockholm, a really hip area, but back then it was the countryside. So he um, organizes free rides to and from the brewery to make sure people would want to come there, like the I- early IKEA buses mm. uh, <laughs> of yore. No, but you'd take from two different places, you'd have um, you'd have transportation to and from the brewery. He also opened the first amusement park brewery, is that one, where you'd have different games and things like that. Mm. And he was very much inspired by German beer culture, uh, where you'd have it uh, decorated like... Um, Beer Stube, sort of a thing, which really became big in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And beer becomes really uh, this more controlled beer where we brew cold fermented beer. And we need to be close to water because we need to get ice from the lakes before we get refrigeration, which comes later. And uh, also you need a lot more space. So you want to have cheap land. So Södermalm and in some cases Normalm as well. Uh, became popular places for that from the perspective of Stockholm. And what they first brew is a style of beer that they start, which would be the equivalent of a medicine, uh or as we would say in, in Swedish, uh, a uh, bash or a <laughs> bayish, <Bayer. laughs> which would be, well, a Bavarian beer, mm-hmm. essentially. So the sort of amber-colored Lager like beer. a Vienna style lager yeah. today, mm-hmm. basically, because the Vienna is actually well right before the Märzen, but they're mm-hmm. essentially the same. Some ver- some differences mm-hmm. in those two styles, uh, but then beer becomes this huge thing, and it's a lot easier to keep them, well, keep the quality high, uh, make sure that they're good for longer. Um, before the lager beer came around, usually you'd buy a beer that would it would go bad quite quickly and you would go to your local closest brewery if you didn't brew yourself you'd go to your local brewery and you'd buy one like a case to go mm-hmm. but now they start delivering beer even with a daily newspaper so you'd get beer delivered and they had cases li- or you know, like barrels but also this is when the the bottle starts coming around and it's around this time that this particular bottle, the 33 centiliter bottle, comes around. That was also born on Södermalm, but actually connected to a different brewery. But they figure out what dimensions we want for a bottle. Uh, and the metric system was a new thing as well. <laughs> um, so they decide on a third, uh, third of a liter, half of a liter, and I forget if they have a full liter as well. But it's in essence the same bottle that we use today to this day that's cool so that's thanks to the lager breweries that just started to push out beer and the guy that started uh, the german brewery he was very much a he was very good at uh, promoting himself so he was the first guy to have the name of his brewery on his delivery and it was just becoming a really really big thing and he also got a bunch of doctors to say it's very good to drink this beer because it's healthy for you and get your appetite up one like one teaspoon uh, per minute or something like that, <laughs> stupid like that. Uh, and he was also lucky that our queen was of German descent. So she thought that the Svensk Öhle that we talked about before. Um, that was crap. That was crap. Mm. And finally, like her home beer had mm. made it. So 
He had a bunch of things happening at once, and that way it just explodes. He was screaming, Ryan Heights, give out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I do want the milkman, but a beer man coming to my place in the morning, delivering six pack. <laughs> yeah, and then oh. the ice man. But that sounds yeah. bad. <laughs> the, the ice man should come at the same time if I don't have a fridge. Yeah. Uh, I, I have you seen those pictures of uh, d- they deliver ice and they yeah. have these big blocks of ice that looks pretty cool. It's hard to imagine. <laughs> and that's like a hundred and uh, yeah. one hundred and fifty years ago. Yeah, and we can thank a lot of th- uh, the brewery business for a lot of those things, mm-hmm. like uh, the refrigerator, for mm-hmm. example. Oh. But then everything went south. Yeah, beer was the big like culprit. Like they they wanted to. Take away beer from the people, basically. Yeah, beer became too big. And we had, uh, this is around the time, if we fast forward a little bit, in the early 1900s, uh, right before 1920, essentially, we start to see that beer isn't, or alcohol isn't so popular anymore. And, for example, uh, Finland goes dry. Uh, you got the prohibition in the U.S., uh, Norway as well. There, there are There are restrictions happening and in Sweden, we start making restrictions as well. But we do it in a really Swedish way. <laughs> yeah, you mean we don't? R- no, but we don't do it as the U.S. did when they, like, you can't drink alcohol. There you go. Oh, we, we, right. we go, uh, here's a book for you, yeah. which you can stamp and pick up this much alcohol. Yeah. So it's, not, it's like a middle ground kind of way. Yeah, Control right. situation. Mm-hmm. Also, it, it connects to to war times. It's a way of of uh, like deciding how much how much can you can you use? Cause, uh, well, we we didn't get as much into the country as we usually would, so you'd have to hold back on some things. And then they just figured, okay, now we can do that with alcohol as well, even though we would so have it's been a rationing issue, basically. Yeah, ra- rationing. That was the word I was mm-hmm. looking for. But the thing is, we hold on to the rationing way too long <laughs> because we get this moot book. Which, if you d- directly translate the the counter book, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> Anyways, uh, this um, is very much the system is really really strange because now we start to control who can buy how much alcohol, how often, uh, and it's all based on like who are you, where do you live, how much money do you make? It's really misogynic as well. To yeah, show, yeah, very much. Women were not really allowed to drink so much at all. And if you have mental illness in the family or somebody has had trouble with drinking before, then maybe you shouldn't have one. So it's, really like, it's very much on, on a local level controlled by these little stores. Around the same time, we also have our first referendum mm-hmm. where we vote on if we're going to make alcohol illegal or not. So when the votes come in, it's essentially 50-50. But the side that wants to keep alcohol wins. But we still keep all of these strange restrictions, but we don't make anything illegal. But what happens is drinking wine is obviously fine because only fancy people can Mm. control themselves. It's posh. Yes. (laughs) And uh, you can also buy a surprising amount of booze or actual liquor. Which is very strange, which I think mm. maybe that was not the best idea because <laughs> that was our biggest problem. <laughs> but beer is the only one that is being treated like a stepchild mm. because we get restrictions where the only beer that you could drink was a beer that was a top 3.5%. Yeah. So we have over 30 years where beer above 3.5% alcohol by volume is illegal. The only way for you to get it is like you mentioned before, going to the doctor and saying that you have trouble sleeping. So you can get prescribed yeah. some, uh, not just any porter. It was Carnegie Porter. Yeah, it was uh, this particular beer, slightly stronger, and that was also drink it like one sip at a time for hours and hours, which I'm sure people did not. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the thing is also we we still uh, this is still ongoing today. With the monopoly of the of alcohol sales, mm. but Mot Boken or the the against counter book or the counter book, <laughs> yeah. it stayed on till 1955. Yeah, it's crazy. So it, this is recent history. Yeah, uh, and still today we're not allowed to buy alcohol on Sundays. No, in the sh- uh, in the or evenings, but in the monopoly stores because mm. they're the only ones who are allowed to sell alcohol at all. 
Yeah, or as Esma said, that, or, or in, in the evenings or on Saturday or evenings specific, mm-hmm. specifically. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're still restricted quite a lot. Um, and national holidays? Yeah. yeah. New Year's Eve is closed, even though it might be on a Monday or yeah. or Christmas and yeah. Christmas Day, it's closed. Midsummer. Midsummer, yeah. yeah. And the, the the weird part that I didn't really understand fully as much as I did when I read a book called Suru Ritskavi in Taha. We you shouldn't have that fun, much no. fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's about the period with the restrictions and what it was like to go out into a restaurant because you are not, strictly speaking, supposed to smile too much because that would mean that you were enjoying it. So people what? were sitting. You're not even supposed to be able to sit comfortably because, well, you shouldn't come there to be comfortable and drink. Like That's not why you go to a bar, of course. No, you should go there, get a meal, and piss off. Yeah. And this is where it gets really, really crazy because they would cut off the, the backs of, of chairs in, in a lot of cases so that it wouldn't be too comfortable sitting there. <laughs> and you would only be allowed to drink a certain amount when you go out to eat and you had to order food. So that's why we have a history of people ordering food that they never ate. And uh, The Pilsner cafes where you have yeah. the cheese sandwich who went out back and forth to tables because you had to order food yeah to get a beer but when you were done with your drinks they took it back and they sent it to the next but, table yeah and th- and that's still here today though because it, if, if you serve alcohol in sweden you have to serve food as well if you go to a restaurant or a bar you yeah. still have you have to so serve three food courses, to be able to three be meals three uh, I, think, I think it's actually more no three you have to have three meals at all times uh, okay anyway okay, serve food you have to point. serve food if you serve alcohol mm, in, yeah, a, in a bar or restaurant yeah. But the part that I had not really grasped myself, which is pretty horrible, is looking at there were only a few bars and restaurants in any in any city at this time. People didn't really go out to drink um, because it wasn't that much fun. <laughs> uh, and if you went out, you might have had, like in the case of Stockholm, a few that were fancy. And those would have still good food still. But essentially all other restaurants didn't matter what they served because everybody went there to drink uh because you couldn't you could you maybe you didn't have enough you couldn't get, go out and buy you went to the bar because you couldn't get it to your home so this meant that the quality of food went down to absurdly low levels and it completely killed not just our brewery like all the breweries that we had which all of them of course died when they weren't allowed to brew strong beer except for export it also killed our restaurant uh, business because nobody cared about food anymore so you you have a restaurant where you could only like make money off of people drinking so you just you made crappy food and closed a lot of restaurants so a lot of historic restaurants were closed for this reason like especially when we talk in more recent history during like the early 80s where the brewery yeah. business was starting up again and then the big ones started they just bought everything. So yeah. I think 1995, there was nine breweries in Sweden, and they were owned by five companies. Yeah. And they all brewed the same beer. Yeah. It's kind of fun to look at what where we are now. Yes. Compared to that, because th- it's been an explosion. It's definitely been an explosion. And it's it's fun to see, and it feels like food is coming back. Like you mentioned, mm-hmm. if you go back to um, 80s, the the restaurant scene wasn't nearly as awesome as it is, and now we get no, you all these get, beers. You can get steak and chips. Yeah, basically that that's that's a fancy meal, a, <laughs> yeah. a shitty steak and chips. But you came to drink anyhow. So yeah, so there's no real or there's no real food and beer combined is a very new phenomenon in Sweden per se. Then or is that yeah. oh yes yeah, I I still feel that we're not really we're not there yet. It but feels we're like getting we're, there. Yeah, we're getting there. W- yeah. When you dig deep into the history of this, you feel like you're in the beginning, basically, <laughs> of something new. It because de- it's definitely it's in the beginning. It feels like the was it mid '90s that that's when it started to loosen up a little bit with the s- s- Sweden joining the the EU Parliament and the well the, 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 the Swedish European beer Union society mm. coming together as well or starting up. The the beers on on Systemlog, the Swedish monopoly, mm. weren't allowed to be more than six percent till we joined. No, European uh, Union. They uh, actually sent all the Orval that was here at the Sjöbolaget. They sent to the boats, the Finland boats, and sold them for five crowns bottle. 
Yeah. Because they couldn't sell it to the Because they, they fermented yeah. the But uh, you can go through the, the, the boat and buy them for five crowns and drink them. <laughs> yeah. But not on land. But <laughs> I've actually heard that during Prohibition in the US, they also had the similar to our our Finland's boat, our booze cruise that we go mm. out. We have um, the, the booze cruise is going out to international waters because it, there it's, um, well, you don't have any restrictions on gambling or drinking. And you could buy booze tax-free. Yes. Mm. Yeah, right. That's an important key, yeah. key factor. Because people came back with more booze than they drank. Yes. Definitely. Definitely. Mm-hmm. And it looked like they drank quite a lot oh, when yeah. they were on those. Uh, but the same was happening in, in, in the U.S. and during Prohibition. So, I mean, we have... Well, you can, you can compare it to other places. And, I mean, you recognize some of our laws, but they feel... A little backwards and slow at this day and age i think but uh, hopefully things are changing uh, we live in a quite an interesting time when it comes to beers yes there there's a lot happening yeah w- what is the future because i mean there's a lot of discussions going on with a bit of monopoly and and uh, well he knows the past ask him uh, you know the past what's the future <laughs> what, what's happening what's go- what's going to be what's beer sweden going to be like in 10 years what stocks should we buy uh, <laughs> um, well what what it feel what feels like it's happening right now is that uh the the really good craft breweries are growing and some of the smaller or less quality ones are falling away so i think we're going to keep might have a little increase but it feels like it's more the quality is has been increasing lately mm-hmm. so i'm guessing and hoping that that's going to continue to happen so that we have a firm base of just high quality beers that just keeps on coming and that they get more mainstream and that we kick all of these big breweries out of the restaurants so all that the, the smaller the yeah and and it feels like we're on the cusp of that and it's going to happen soon well, one thing about that i think uh, that is one of the main reasons why one of the biggest trends right now is classic beer styles because the small brewers are realizing with these styles if we do it right and good, mm. we can actually get the restaurants and the bars to buy our stuff instead of the big big corporate, yeah. basically. Yeah, but, but not only that, I think it, what's something that has happened and really needs to have more is places like Akrat Oliver Twist and these beer bars, uh, other than Akrat Oliver Twist, but, but the, the l- beer bars where people work in there had the knowledge of the beer, so they're serving the traditional beer right and having clean taps and, and serving the beer right so people yeah. know what it should actually taste like i think we're moving there you and me we went to north shopping a couple of months back we went to gulula gulula shout out to gulula really good Amazing place yeah. oh. and, I, I and, and the been. quality of the beer Moscow. is fantastic and and they do have an interesting tap mm. list with mm. traditional and modern mm. cater to everyone and they're super nice yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah but there's more of those small places in small towns popping up, and they survive. Yeah. Now, now I don't know. It's been a pandemic going on. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, so I've I mean, heard. I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I moved from from my hometown six years ago, and there's new places that has popped up after I moved away. The place I used to work at is gone, or it's a wine bar now. So, <laughs> sadly, but it's uh, there. I'll just do again which uh, I think good guys were doing something. I don't know. I don't know the brewery, but they have a place now. It's uh, with a lot of beer and, and good quality, what I've heard. So it's they're coming slowly, these places. And I think that's important because if you can't educate, because when you go, if you don't know it, when you go to Bulaget and you never tried, I don't know, tequila, yeah, how, how would you know how to what, what to buy? No. Uh, you sure you have these little small uh, samples thingies, but yeah, it's it's still a gamble. Definitely. Yeah. Hopefully, we're um, we'll just keep going, but it doesn't seem to be stopping. I feel like when when you start drinking beer because you enjoy it, it tends to go that way. You start drinking less. You drink less, but you drink you spend more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good yeah. beer isn't expensive. It just costs a little bit more money. Yeah. Yeah. Someone said that. Someone said that. I don't know. He said <laughs> guy called Christian or something. He's <laughs> an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. No. no, but I feel like well, when you start enjoying the beer and actually think about what you're drinking, you you start choosing what you're drinking instead of yeah. buying your twenty four can. And going home and drink that in a in a night or two, you you choose your beers so you want to try and you taste them and you sit for, with them for a while. Definitely speaking from personally, but I don't know <laughs> with you guys. But I'm do, I'm I feel like that's same. happening with beer geeks. <laughs> yeah. You will. Yes. We gonna 
finish off in a few moments. Yes. We still have to ask you the final question. Yeah, oh, we crap, we I put forgot. this to you. We put this to you last time and you've forgotten what you said. Yeah. You said earlier uh, anyhow. So uh and for some reason you are dying twice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm dying again. You only you only live twice. Ah, uh, you you you, you <laughs> accidentally <laughs> survived. Like a you accidentally movie. survived the last time, so you had a, a last beer without Well, dying. now last, I need to know what I drank before because it might kill my um taste buds for the next beer. Yeah. Um uh, it's, it's it's so difficult because it feels like uh, I would I would definitely choose something of a classic beer. Uh, some of the classic beer styles, uh, and it always goes lately for the last two years or so. It's been uh, English bitters and a well Czech or German pilsners a lot. Um, so now I just got to pick brands here. <laughs> um, but I feel a bit more English today, so I'd say why not pick a um, landlord as my last beer. Timothy, Timothy Taylor's, Taylor's landlord, yeah, yeah. hand pumped. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, what it's, I it's like. a good brew, guys out there. Thank you for tuning in, and you will. It's been an absolute pleasure. We we could talk for hours and hours, but we have to finish. Yeah, I'm yeah. just gonna read now. a little teaser for you. Will oh is, yeah, you will is coming back for yeah. an episode in the near future because he's uh, also a fromager. Yeah, yeah. so. That episode is going to include beer and cheese and three full stomachs and hopefully happy. And also, guys. if you if you want to read more about what you will has written, yeah. uh, Care of Hops, I don't know which number it is. You got it there. Mm. Yep, yep. The last one I wrote about Stockholm beer history in this one. So but there are two different covers on this it. This one, but uh, it's, it's Care of Hops Autumn 2021. That's a little mm. confusing as we're sitting um, here and <laughs> uh, we're sitting here in, in in the beginning of 2022. Yeah. But still, it's the number is called Autumn 2021. If you want to read more about mm. uh, Jewel's, well, what he writes about his beer history, basically, and you can also visit yeah. him on mm. Instagram, right, at Ole Dog Puken, which yeah. is beer <laughs> diary, <laughs> uh, or you could always check out my my homepage. It's Jewelheadman.com. Even that's better. Even that's better. what I do. Mm. So, and that's where they can book tours and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, you well. can. S- yeah, you'll you'll find all important information like tours that I do, or uh, if I do some sort of a lecture thing, or I do a tasting, or whatever else I do. We only have one more thing to say to you guys, and that is drink, drink better, better beer. beer. Well, that's it for this time. Join us again next week for CC School on how to make beer. We bring the bubbliest podcasts. Welcome to Beer Bubble!